welcome back to Dangerous Minds. This is a video to talk about what went wrong with Chris's story. Now, of course, when he got in front of the media, he falters with his eye like, I mean, I like uh, exhausted, uh, have no inclination, and it was just a train wreck. There was just no free flow of information where there should have been, because it just should be from memory. Basically, he's absolutely correct when by the end of the day he was saying, I shouldn't have gone in front of the media. That was a mistake. Yes, there was a mistake. And he would have put pressure, internal pressure on him that he didn't need at that stage. Then when he starts his formal interviews with the police, his timeline is, is full of convenient gaps. She goes to sleep. Yeah, okay. That he... Straight away, 10 minutes after she's walked through the door, it's not believable. She had a ritual. People don't just go to sleep 10 minutes after they've walked through the door from the airport, no matter what it is. And on top of that, she's an OCD person. She had a ritual. Her rituals really were rituals. She had regimented ways of doing things. She took off her makeup. The police knew to ask this, to ascertain whether they thought she had actually got to sleep they asked him, what is her routine before bed? And he stepped off her routine, what she always did. Now, we know with Shanann, what she always did, she always did. So right there, there's something wrong. And to cover up what happened in those intervening hours, he said they were asleep. So then he doesn't have to come up with another story. And then 4 o'clock, apparently he wakes her up, or 4.15. Now, that's just not... But that's not realistic because she's only just gone to bed and the and the police pick this up. That's why they question him about it because it just it doesn't make any sense. And he arms and ahs and uses the wrong language. I mean, slid into bed. You don't slide into bed if you're going to have this in, this conversation about splitting up. You might sit on the edge of the bed or something like that, but you're certainly not going to slide into bed. Now... It's more like he's drawing from sexting with Kessinger, so those words coming to his mind, he's got confused uh, because he's sliding into bed. So that just doesn't ring true, and it's completely the um, wrong language, which shows deception. He's totally stuffed up his word choice. His use of the word we is problematic as well because he's saying we said, we felt – but we know by her text and by the letter that she was going to give him that she had a totally different viewpoint. So there's not going to be any we as if they're agreeing on on the discussion points. And he doesn't know anything about this letter quite obviously. And the first thing she would have done was gone to get the letter if he initiated any type of conversation like this. We use pronouns according to unfolding events. So we can be pretty sure that these events did not unfold. Not anything like the way he's describing they did. So I believe it's very unlikely this discussion took place at all. Then the next thing he's saying is, it was fine. He was downstairs and it was fine. Now, how could you possibly use the word fine when your wife's upstairs sobbing her eyes out because you've had this gut-wrenching conversation and you've decided to say, finito, finished, we're split up forever. You've got a pregnant wife, two kids on the way, but everything's fine. No, it doesn't work, doesn't fit, and he knows it's about to get him in deep doo-doos because he knows the police know it too. It's not realistic. It's made up. And let's hope the next idiot who thinks the solution is getting rid of his family looks at this and realises it doesn't work. And we really didn't need all that information about his pa packed lunch and his water jug, and we really didn't need to know all about your packed lunch and your toolbox. We know more about that than we do about the circumstances that made your wife run away. So according to his narrative, they had this big emotional discussion, enough to make her run away. She's not coming back because the media and, and the media is there, the police there, yet she's still not coming back because it was so horrendous. And yet we know so little about this alleged discussion, but we know everything about his toolbox and his clear containers and his lunchbox. Oh, what is going on? And you can bet your life this is not lost on the police. And I'm pretty sure he knows it. Now, allegedly, he goes to work at 5.30. And then he says he's kind of concerned because he didn't hear from her by five, uh, 7.40. But this is only two hours after he's left home. She's hardly had any sleep, so why doesn't he think she's asleep? 
why doesn't she think he's she's decompressing from this emotional abyss he's thrown her in no he thinks it's weird that he hasn't heard from her or something and then he rings to check to see if the kids aren't uh, if she's taken the kids anywhere but he's monitoring the security because later he sees nicole um rock up to the thing to the door so he he knows if she's if shenan's come or gone so this is obviously the police know that this is a pretext this text is a pretext because he doesn't fit in the rest of his story If what he was saying was true, he'd just be thinking she's trying to get her mind together so she can proceed with her day, with her business and everything else after this bombshell is dropped on her. But no, apparently he's texting her on the pretext of asking what she's done with the kids. No, not asking how she is. No, no, not texting to show compassion. No, just pretending to check on the kids. There's absolutely no reason why she would be contacting him. He had definitely said, no, I've thought about it. It's it's over. We're separating. That's it. He'd be leaving her to decompress, as he calls it. And I think on some level he realises he's made this error of judgement. So he points out the kids check. But that doesn't work either because he loses all emotional connection with it. Because his very next word is nothing and it just hangs with no attachment whatsoever to anything. Even so much that the police had to clarify what he was saying. So he has no emotional attachment to, ch- attachment to checking on his kids. So it, it, it's just all falling apart for him. Yet on the day when he was sending those texts, I'm sure he was all happy as Larry because he thought he was making a good cover for himself. But now he's realising, whoops, really not that great of a plan. Nonetheless, on the day, up to this point, he thinks everything's going okay. But 12 o'clock comes along and he says that he texted her again. Now, this is another cover, so it's okay. 12.10, however, Nicole turns up at the door and he is monitoring the security footage and he knows she's turned up. And he even, he kind of says the word driving. Now, I don't know if that means he was driving or what, because he he becomes flustered again. And this is a cue to the detectives that this is a trigger, this is a stressor for him. So they, they then build on this. But anyway, he says that um, he watched, he watched Nicole. And then he could only watch her for 10 minutes. Because after that, he, he, he called her to try to defuse the situation and get her away. Obviously, he watched her for those 10 minutes, hoping that she was going to go away, that she was just going to leave. But she was determined and knew something was wrong because she knew her friend wouldn't be doing this. She was, she was genuine, genuinely concerned for her friend's welfare. And so she wasn't going anywhere. So this is when he, he called her to try to defuse the situation. And to say, yeah, we had a fight, she's gone to a friend's house. But the problem was, Nicole knew that Shanann would only turn to two, one of two people, herself or another person she was on the phone to. And Shanann wasn't at either place, nor was she answering their talk, calls or texts. But Chris didn't want to listen to her, of course not, because he doesn't want the um, cops involved. He's got things he's got to do when he gets home. He's got things he's got to do maybe before he gets home. He's got to get back out to server 319 and pick up those sheets and everything else, take them back, take everything from the house and go and dump them somewhere. But he he couldn't do any of those things if the police were already involved. So he wants her gone, but she's not going. She's absolutely adamant, well, I'm ringing the cops. So then he has to start going home he's hoping that she's going to go away but she doesn't she rings the cops instead he finds out she's rung the cops oh my god he must be in panic now he what's he going to do there's all these things that he hasn't done his plan is falling apart and he is stressed and because he's stressed by the time he gets home he has to talk to the police and the and he, and then he gets caught up in the wrong narrative he gets caught up in the um narrative of oh um, she didn't contact me. Um, yeah, she, instead of saying, well, I, well, you know, she didn't contact me because we had this this um, fight. So I don't know where she is. But he's not calm about that. He, he, he gets confused. He's half between his narrative and half between um, the narrative of all the concerned friends because his narrative never took place. So that's why he, his mind keeps forgetting 
how he should be reacting if what he says is true. And, of course, the police would be watching this as well and realising he's falling apart. So when they ask him, it is not usual that um, she would return the calls, he stumbles and goes, ah, oh, for them, yeah, like, like um, all the time. Because in his mind, he's realising he's... Uh, he, He's getting confused and, yeah, it's unusual for them, but it wouldn't be unusual for, for her not to contact him. But then he forgets it's not unusual for her not to contact him because they had the fight. He says, oh, because she gets busy with the kids, which would be true on a normal day, but on this particular day it's not. It's because they had the fight. So the, the te detectives are seeing he, he's stumbling over his own story. But then they heap more pressure on him and they talk about the Apple Watch and of course, the Apple Watch is a, is a stressor for him because if someone finds the Apple Watch, they'll be able to see um, what happened to her and what time he attacked her and, and, and what time the, there's a cessation of heartbeat because more than likely, she's got, um, she's got an app on that watch. It's going to give historical data on her heart rate. So this is another stressor. And so they're pouring on the stressing he, stressors here. For, and he's going to be crumbling inside. And then straight after that, the detective um, asks about the change of password to the due date of the son, the son that the detective knows very well Chris actually wanted. So this is going to be more internal stress because this is going to be emotional stress inside him when he, no matter how cold-hearted he is, it's go, he's going to be affected by the fact that, yeah, he never, never got to experience that son. Then the detective says to him, hey, we've got all these toys, we can track your car. So he knows, uh, Chris knows that if he gets out of that police station, he's still rooted because he can't dump any of the things or anything else because they're going to monitor his car. And then the detective expands on this, playing even more mind games with him by saying, oh, your Lexus is outside. Oh, might get a court order and put a bug on it and then we'll be able to know exactly where you go. And he, of course, he, he, his work truck is GPS, so then he, he's just going to think the same thing. He's trapped with his Lexus as well. And then Chris says, yes, I know that it was a whirlwind. I didn't think all this was going to happen. No, exactly. He didn't think all this was going to happen. It didn't factor into his plan. And then they just ever so casually mention the neighbour's video, and they know how much he sweated in that. He went into I surrender pose. So inside, he's reliving that turmoil. He's feeling that emotion again. And he knows with all of this on him, he's trapped. He's cooked. He's done. And then they give him the polygraph, and they said, look, you failed the polygraph. You failed it dismally. You're hopeless. You're a hopeless liar, and you're never going to get away with it. And he's like, that's just the last straw for him. You're a hopeless liar. And, oh, well, that's it. I'm done. I'm cooked. But once he reached that, once he felt trapped, he knew he was done. He knew he was cooked. And that was it. He's not stupid. He knew. He knew that they had. Kudos to Nicole Atkinson for getting this chain of events rolling, not listening to him, going with her gut feeling about her friend and I'm sure her friend is very proud that Nicole was able to bring this to closure so quickly because without Nicole, regardless of what the end outcome would have been, it would not have been as quick as this and it would not have been able to mount the pressure to just get him to break so quickly. And I'm sure Shanann is up there in heaven with her kids, looking down and thanking Nicole Atkinson and thanking God that she had Nicole Atkinson as a friend because Nicole Atkinson is a true friend.